Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's good to see a pretty full house. That's great. Um, my name's John Faulkner. I'm Curator of Visual Arts at the British Library. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's conversation, which is one of a series of events being held in conjunction with our Moguls exhibition, which I hope you will all have seen, or if not, will plan to see. It's a wonderful treat and celebration of a vibrant and important culture. Um, I'm not going to hold up the proceedings much except to introduce our two guests. Um, Michael Wood, um, who you may have seen at previous events, um, is a well-known historian, broadcaster, and filmmaker, not only about India, but um, a particular interest and in speciality in Anglo-Saxon culture. But the two films which you may be familiar with is his story of India, and one which is a great favorite of mine in the footsteps of Alexander the Great. Um, Michael will be talking to our principal guest this evening, Pankaj Mishra, and the title of this evening's conversation is called The Ruins of Empire, which relates to the author's most recent book, which um, I'm in the middle of reading with huge interest and enthusiasm, and I think if you look at the celebratory reviews that it's had, you'll gather some of the interest it's, it's aroused. Um, and a little bit of controversy somewhere because it starts to tell the stories of people who are little known in the Western narrative of imperial history, uh, a largely celebratory narrative. Um, and this book presents some counter-arguments to that and presents us with a range of fascinating and important figures who have been ignored or downplayed in previous history. I'm not going to say any more because I believe Michael is going to make a few introductory remarks about our guests. So I will ask you to welcome our two speakers today and hand over to Michael. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. It's a really great pleasure and a, a, a privilege to be here to welcome Pankaj tonight and, uh, and to, to, to listen to him. Um, his books and journalism, it seems to me, constitute a most powerful and eloquent commentary on our times. And uh, um, if I can put it so uh, uh, crassly, the post-colonial or the post-imperial tradition, the dilemmas of the great traditional civilizations of Asia when faced with the impact of, of the West in technology and values and and so on, and those are the things we'll talk about tonight. I, I just wanted to say one word, being a fan, as it were, that there's, among Pankaj's many writings, uh, and you may not all be familiar with them, are a trilogy of books which really are, are, should be on everybody's bookshelf, I think. An End to Suffering, which I can remember taking with me Gosh, eight years ago, was it, Pankaj, that you, so you've, you published it uh, and reading it in India, which is a really one of the great modern memoirs of uh, travel, history, contemplation, many things. Temptation of the West, um, uh, a, a fabulous travel, political, well, thriller as well, actually, an extraordinary series of essays. And our main theme tonight, which you've, John's already spoken about, The Ruins of Empire, um, all of these books mix autobiography and travel and history and politics and historiography too. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, underpinned by rigorous historical analysis. Um, it's a, the new book's a great work of history, it seems to me. But also what makes them so appealing is the, is the actual experience. You, you know, they're, they're, they're all informed by tenacious, on-the-ground observation, the willingness to put yourself right in the middle of things and to hang out there for as long as it takes to get the kind of answers that you're looking for. But at the same time, they've all got a really deep sympathy for people, especially those downtrodden, middling sort of people who never get written about in travel books with their anxieties and their aspirations. Mr Sharma um, in... in uh, Pankaj's landlord in, in, in this wonderful book, and, uh, and even Rajesh, the fellow student at Benares who turns out to be a hit man <laughs> for, um, for, for criminals and gangsters. Anyway, um, Hilary Mantel called 
called Pankaj an intrepid, endlessly questioning spirit. And the new book is an absolutely audacious historical sweep. Um, it focuses on the period which we're all taught to see as the heyday of the Western empires, the Victorian empires, peace and prosperity and self-confidence and so on, but which a time which Asian peoples experienced as catastrophe. Uh, I was reminded recently reading a book on Victorian war poetry that every year of Victoria's reign, 63, nearly 64 years, the Brits were fighting a war somewhere in the world. And the rediscovery of Asia over the next hundred years, as Pankaj shows in the book, is not just economic, but intellectual. That's the core of the book. And that's the template that he's offering to us all to see, um, to see that history from a different viewpoint. The book has three great characters, mesmerising characters that most of us perhaps were unaware of. Um, and I'd really like to start off by asking you, Pankaj, uh, to give us a few thumbnail portraits of these, these astonishing people, um, starting with Jamal al-Afghani. I'll try. Well, thank, thanks for the um, incredibly kind um, introduction, uh, the opposite of what the hitman does. <laughs> <laughs> you just did. Um, so it's nice to have you as a friend. Um, <laughs> al-Afghani. Um, Incredibly uh, versatile character. He was born um, in Iran, uh, Shiite origin, but disguises origins when he traveled uh, through mostly Sunni countries, Sunni Muslim countries, and became hugely influential in most of the um, societies he traveled through. He was such a, I mean, he was, he was sort of the first activist of his time in, in, in the sense that he was the first to diagnose the incredible challenge Western imperialism, British imperialism in particular, posed to Muslim societies in South Asia and the Middle East. And he did this because he was in India soon after the suppression of the mutiny, uh, from which we can see some poignant pictures at the, um, at the exhibition in the library. And he was there immediately after that. And uh, the lessons he drew from that experience he amplified wherever he went, in Egypt, Turkey, uh, Iran, of course, because people there, you have to remember, hadn't really been that exposed to imperialism, Western imperialism at that point, to the same degree as India uh, and South Asia. So he went out there and said, look, if you don't strengthen yourselves, if you do not uh, build strong enough institutions, if you don't educate your women, if you don't educate your citizens, uh, you're going to suffer the same fate that I saw these poor Indians suffer in, in 1857. So this was a sort of basic, simple message. And then he, of course, elaborated. Uh, he, he spun various elaborations on what Muslims need to do. And not just Muslims. I mean, he was working with uh, Syrian Christians from Damascus. He was working. One of his main collaborators was a Jewish Arab uh, who he worked with also in Paris. He also spent some time in Paris, a great traveler, actually. Um, so, uh, you know, an extremely cosmopolitan figure at a time when the word cosmopolitan hadn't really come into vogue. Uh, traveling, being exposed to many different cultures, learning a lot, um, and picking up languages, picking up uh, different, picking up, you know, making contacts with all kinds of people. Um, but also, um, you know, incredibly restless. Uh, moving from one idea to another, and he was forced to because he was, you know, faced with this very, uh, uh, you know, this very increasingly serious threat all through the 19th century, um, because the Europeans were, were were gaining and were kind of expanding so rapidly, dramatically in the second half of the 19th century, and he was witnessing all this, and so he was, you know, at one point he was saying, let's embrace liberal constitutional democracy. Hindu-Muslim unity in India. That was one message he was uh, amplifying in India. And then, towards the end of his life, he embraced a version of what we now call pan-Islamism. Very different thing back then. Um, so he was you know, constantly trying to work up a response to what do we, people in the Muslim countries, people in Asian countries, need to do in order to survive with dignity in a world that is increasingly dominated by 
really small number of Western countries, Western European countries. Uh, this was also uh, the message that someone like Liang Chichao, who is the, the second figure I talk about in the book, the sort of first, China's first modern intellectual in the sense that he was the first one to start publishing, one of the first Chinese to start publishing uh, periodicals for a mass audience, for a general audience. Mm -hmm start publishing history books, writing articles, educating a Chinese public that was coming into be being at that time. And again, telling them that China is under threat and China is about to be subjugated. And these are the things you need to do. And uh, this is what other countries are doing. This is the fate other countries are suffering at this point. Mm -hmm. And so he takes on, I mean, he uh, really sort of starts to write and, and travel in the late uh, towards the end of the 19th century, al Afghani is dead by that time. And so all across East Asia, Liang Chichao becomes uh, this sort of major figure, huge influence on the Chinese, next generation of Chinese intellectuals and activists. And also al Afghani, I forgot to mention, was a huge influence on mm -hmm. the second and third generation of Muslim thinkers and activists. You know, the first uh, nationalist icon of uh, the, the father of the Egyptian nation was a disciple of his. Mm -hmm. Uh, various Iranian liberals, constitutionalists, in, were disciples of his. Even the Iranian uh, revolutionaries of the indeed, 1979 they, they also, claim him exactly, as a, Exactly. His, his sort of very mixed, interesting, yeah. interestingly yeah. mixed legacy that yeah. left-wingers in Turkey, uh, hardline Islamists in Iran, uh, all of them could draw, you know, inspiration from this from this figure. But Afghan is not a, a hardline Islamist, but he is he does believe that in Islam lies a source of regeneration. Does Islam he? How, lies how does, how does also, he see that? I think his relationship with religion, with Islam, was pragmatic. He saw Islam as a source of solidarity. Uh, you're looking at societies where there are no trade unions, there are no NGOs, there are no there's no civil society as such. So if you want to politically organize, if you want to mobilize the masses, then the one thing that they all share, the masses, is Islam and belief in the ideals of Islam. So if you want to you know, have a strong political movement in those countries, it was very straightforward, you know, to someone like, very obvious to someone like al Afghani, then you have to invoke Islamic notions against uh, Western imperialism, which is not to say that you have to reject everything the West has to offer to you. He was uh, very much in favor of learning from the West and you know, actually was constantly denouncing various obscurantist um, tendencies within uh, Muslim societies at that time, including mullahs. And he was very much against the kind of learning that was being imparted in, in, in madrasas, for instance. Uh, he very much wanted a Western, some, some aspects of Western style education, particularly in the sciences and mathematics. And his speeches are full of these exhortations. To, um, uh, to the Muslims that he, that he, that he spoke to. So he's situated in a different area from, I mean, post the uh, First War of Independence, the Great okay. Indian Rebellion, you've got a, uh, you have got a, a, a Deobandi people and so on. You, there's, I mean, some of the people the Brits arrest call themselves Talibs, don't they, back then? Yeah. They, they, they represent one Islamic reaction. He's got a pan-Islamic reaction, which is rather different, you're saying. Which is, you're which is very different, and you know, in all Muslim societies, or major Muslim societies at that time, whether it's Turkey or Egypt, there's a very strong liberal tradition of people actually you know, diagnosing this peculiar nature of Western power and saying, well, we need to learn from the West, and we need to also strengthen ourselves in these ways, whether it's by modernizing our army, by having a constitution or having an elected parliament, mm -hmm. all these things we have to adopt, whether it's the young Ottomans in, in Turkey, whether it's the young, you know, whether it's the, the, the young Turks in, uh, in, in Turkey later on, um, or the liberal constitutionists in Egypt. So I think the liberal tradition at that point is very much dominant. Of course you have, you know, the fanatics and the fundamentalists too, uh, people talking of jihad, but even pan-Islamism, you know, it's not really this thing that we now associate it with, which is with Osama bin Laden. It's, it's a completely different thing at that point. This is very much, pan-Islamism is a very much a response developed in Ottoman Turkey to what they perceived quite correctly as pan-Europeanism. You know, all the European powers pressing down very hard upon the Ottomans. And they said, well, if they can invoke 
uh, you know, racial and religious solidarity. Why can't we do the same? And mind you, at the same time, I've been reading the history of Java. You know, people in Java back in the 1830s and 40s are beseeching the Ottoman Sultan, you know, please save us from these Dutch uh, imperialists. You know, can you do something about this? Uh, people in Xinjiang later on in the 1860s. And these appeals are finally reaching the Ottoman emperor. And that's where Al Afghani comes in and says, well, I'm your man. You know, I can actually uh, you know, create this particular unity you're looking for, Pan-Islamic. I'm such a traveler and I have these contacts. That's towards the end of his life. So you know, he travels through a whole range of uh, political mm -hmm. tendencies and, and ideas mm -hmm. uh, in his short life, which we see. You know, sort of manifested in different forms in, in, in over the next hundred years. And Liang too. Before we turn to your third great character in the, in this the, the book, uh, Liang too was a, a great traveller. And the, all these Absolutely. people uh, have seen more of the world than almost any Western intellectual of that time that you could mention, haven't they? They, the, they really absolutely. Have. I mean, they are, they are very, and for that reason, they are unconventional thinkers. I mean, when we think of intellectuals, um, we think of people who are very much confined to one place, an institution, academic institution, or library, university, uh, and all the great figures of, for instance, modern Western intellectual tradition, you could say these are people who have spent their lives, you know, particular areas, and, um, and basically not been travelers, or certainly haven't derived most of their ideas through travel or through exposure to other societies. I mean, whether it's Macaulay or Hegel, you know, spinning all these completely absurd ideas about India and China sitting mm. in Germany, mm. or uh, James Mill. I mean, any number of people you can think of, very limited exposure to other societies, yeah. and let yet- me, let, me re let me interrupt you and, re and, and just read your wonderful epigraph on Hegel, West, Western views of uh, the history of China, 1820, the history of China, has shown no development. So we cannot concern ourselves with it any further. China and India, as it were, lie outside the course of world history. That's, this is like Macaulay's announcement that one shelf of European literature was worth the whole of the literature of the subcontinent. Exactly. Not yeah. that he knew any of the literature of the subcontinent. but He didn't need yeah. to. So, uh, so, you're, so people like Al Afghani and Liang are... Uh, seeing the world from a, they're standing in a different position. They're standing, and they are the thinking on the run. You know, yeah. these are people under tremendous pressure uh, because their societies are threatened mm. and they know that they will sink if they don't devise solutions to the in, 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 in immense problems they face. So they are traveling, they're constantly comparing mm. their societies to other societies. I mean, Liang goes to America in 1903 and has some incredible perceptions on the state of America at that time, about the state of American democracy, about the state of American capitalism, the, the huge inequalities he sees there, for instance, you know, how a small percentage of people mm. have cornered uh, a disproportionate uh, share of the national wealth and, you know, and the rest have been left to fend for themselves. Mm. Yeah, what does he uh, say? Do, can, you, can you remember? He, he doesn't need to talk about 200,000 people owning, I can't remember what owning, it is. Owning, I mean, he, ha he also has actually stati some statistics. I wonder where he yeah. got them yeah, from, yeah, about yeah. owning about 80% of the national yeah. wealth, yeah. which is not um, uh, actually, things haven't changed much uh, <laughs> compared. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. also the way, um, you know, American democracy uh, works and how it's been, <laughs> corroded from within by special interests, by corporate interests, by lobbyists. Mm. Um, this is Gosh, also- things haven't changed then. <laughs> exactly, I mean, it's, it's yeah. really remarkable yeah, the yeah. way, you know, we've been so accustomed to uh, Asian societies being looked at or being judged in these kinds of harsh ways, or yeah. Hegel or Macaulay, or, or even people traveling there and saying, you know, uh, and, and actually completely <laughs> misdiagnosing. You could say so much of intellectual endeavor in the last 50 years has been aimed at removing the misconceptions created by people like Hegel and you know, created by 19th century European thinkers about China and India. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, compared to that, I mean, you know, someone like Al Afghani or someone like Liang was incredibly perceptive about the societies they were traveling through. But as I said, I mean, they were also, they had to, they were, they were great uh, you know, risk in getting things wrong at that point. Um, they just had to focus very hard on uh, they just couldn't coast on the national power um, of their respective societies. You spoke about Al, Al Afghani and his attitude to Islam. Um, what's Liang's attitude towards 
traditional Chinese civilization, because those who follow him will just destroy it, won't they? Yeah. What, what, where, what's his take on the path China should take? He went through several phases. You know, he was originally uh, very much a Confucianist brought up in the traditional um, Chinese system of education and, you know, very much set on that path of joining the civil services. He was, in fact, traveling to uh, Peking to sit for his um, civil service examinations when his ship was stopped by uh, Japanese and uh, he and his mentor and they both witnessed the humiliation of um, China by this upstart new power Japan and that sort of set them on this different path altogether analyzing why is China so weak why have we and people you know like us who've been at the center of East Asia for such a long time why are we being pushed around and bullied and humiliated in this fashion and perhaps what we need to do is modernize the imperial system the monarchy so he started off very much as a kind of you know, conservative reformer. So let's hold on to the monarchy. Let's hold on to the, hold on to the imperial system. Do some you know, uh, changes to it. Introduce a you know, new Western style educational system. Let's do away with this you know, old imperial system of uh, education, this you know, uh, bureaucracy. Um, but uh, the way in which China was humiliated over you know, beginning the Boxer Rebellion, uh, that brought home to him the uh, possibility that something much more radical might be needed and that we might actually actually overthrow this whole imperial system or this system of uh, monarchy altogether and what China needs to be is a liberal republican country. Uh, so he embraced uh, Western ideas of democracy, Western ideas of liberalism, but then he went through another phase where he saw, and, he, and the trip to America was an eye-opener for him, um, thinking that liberal democracy is no good for a country uh, like China. Uh, liberal democracy in its own original setting in a country like America is being corrupted and corroded. And in a country like China, which needs to urgently strengthen itself and become powerful enough to face the challenge of the West, liberal democracy will drag us down. What we need is a kind of enlightened autocracy. Uh, what we need is state capitalism. Uh, we need the state to support our businessmen and to build industrial strength. So again, you know, responding to particular situations and devising. So he became, uh, and then subsequently, he witnessed the, um, the immense uh, uh, slaughter of the First World War, or the, the after effects. Um, and uh, that completely broke his faith in uh, Western ideas of science, of democracy, of liberalism. And he thought, you know, these people who claim to be paragons of civilization, they've just ended up slaughtering each other for four years in a war nobody knew how to end, uh, completely pointlessly. We have nothing to learn from them. And that our Confucian ways that talk of harmony, that talk of brotherhood, much, much better. Uh, so he retreated into a you know, highly conservative position towards the end of his life, which is the point at which he meets uh, and strikes a friendship with uh, the third figure in the book, Tagore. Tagore. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore, who yeah. we think of uh, as, a, as an Indian poet, as a Bengali, <laughs> a Bengali poet, but he was also uh, a great um, thinker, a, a commentator, a great traveler. He traveled everywhere. I mean, there's some travels that I haven't written about in the book. He traveled to Cairo <laughs> and he met Al Afghani's disciple and they had an exchange of letters. Um, he traveled to Baghdad, he traveled to Iran, he traveled to China, Japan, Java, Indonesia, everywhere. And again, uh, assessing you know, these particular societies, uh, also comparing them to India and wondering what India needs to do um, again you know, in this world that where um, Western style politics, Western style uh, economy was held as a supreme model, as a thing that everyone should adopt. Um, and that's where he sort of you know, starts talking to Liang, and Liang is hugely influenced by Tagore at that point. Um, and you know, they both sort of start telling the Chinese, and Tagore goes on this famous visit to uh, China in 1924, where he uh, wants to tell the Chinese that, uh, look, don't imitate the West. Um, I know you've been humiliated, and I know, you know that makes you want to develop the kind of military power that the West has accumulated. I know it makes you want to create these nation states, 
and to inculcate a strong sense of Chinese nationalism. Mm -hmm. But look, this is a terrible mistake you're making mm -hmm. uh, because that's just going to lead to a lot of violence. And he already is seeing Japan you know, going down that path and he's also telling the Japanese that, look, your attempts to imitate the West is going to end in disaster, which of course it did. Mm. But, um, J but Japan's um, initial uh, astonishing success, for instance, over the Russian Empire at absolutely. Tsushima in 1905, yeah. this, had, this had electrified people across Asia. I mean, it just had a take us huge back sort of to that galvanizing moment. effect yeah. on a range of people. Uh, in fact, the book begins with this moment uh, in 1905 with Japan defeating Russia. Uh, at the Battle of uh, Tsushima, and the news spreads around the world, and, and, and a range of people from, you know, Gandhi, who was an unknown lawyer in South Africa at that time, uh, to Sun Yat-sen, who happens to be in London, uh, and Ataturk, who's just a little soldier in, in, in Damascus, a very young soldier, they all receive this news, and in far off Java, Malay Peninsula, everywhere, this news is greeted with great excitement that for the first time, a non-white country has defeated you know, a uh, major uh, kind of Western European military power. Mm. And if the, Jap if the Japanese can do this, if they can modernize themselves fast enough, um, then surely we can do the same. And we can also live with dignity in this world where you know, we are constantly humiliated by mm. European power. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great message that's sort of you know, likely possible national regeneration, that all of these people, the Egyptian nationalists, and Nehru in his, Nehru, I forgot to mention, he's a sort of you know, public school boy at that point. He's going, he's traveling to his uh, uh, public school in, uh, in the UK when the news um, uh, reaches him and he's tremendously elated. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the message they took was that we can all become strong nation states like Japan and uh, again, hold our heads up um, with, with dignity, but De Gaulle sees the dark side of that, and he goes around alerting people to it, that look, if you start doing this, then you're just basically gonna do to your own people and to your neighbors what Western powers have been doing to you. Mm. Um, and this is a message he, he, he sends out in Japan, he's much ridiculed, he's called the man from the lost country, the poet from the lost country, and both the Japanese and the Chinese have a very contemptuous view of India at that point. It's a completely defeated, uh, conquered, subjugated country. Uh, they've lost their culture. The British have completely overwhelmed them. And so who are you to give us lectures about this? Uh, and also in China, when he gets there in 1924, the, the Communist Party has been formed, and uh, the Chinese radicals, the, the second generation of Chinese thinkers and activists who initially followed Liang who were in hugely inspired by Liang Zhichao, and now they are turning their back on him. You think he's just a fuddy-duddy guy who's gone crazy, um, embracing Confucianism in his old age. What China needs is science, democracy. We need uh, you know, have a proper political movement. We need to construct a strong nation state. So they are start, you know, embarking on a different journey altogether, which will, you know, which as we know, goes in a very different direction altogether. So they are uh, simply not prepared to receive mm. of Tego's message. So mm. he's ridiculed, he's heckled, and booed. He has to mm. cut short his uh, mm. trip and uh, return to India. Mm. But he plays, a, I think, a crucial role in the book uh, by simply showing how so many uh, Asian countries were, in one sense, uh, under the pressure of events, forced to adopt certain Western techniques, um, whether it's you know, the nation state, I think that nation state is the most important of them. And uh, s that experiment, that adventure was not going to end well. That, that those, the idea, the Western idea of the nation state was not uh, suited to these multi-ethnic, multi-religious mm -hmm. societies of Asia. That basic message, I think, <coughs> remains true to this very day. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think he was an incredibly prescient figure. In, 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 in sort of seeing this uh, very clearly. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you speak about, and perhaps which links those three fascinating characters, is that um, uh, all of them have a sense that in the richness of the uh, cultures of their great civilizations to which they belong, uh, there is a resource for uh, remodeling the future. You're not, you don't 
you're not uh, leaving that behind. Are you? Um, but in a sense, um, the traumas of the 20th century perhaps <coughs> suggest that some of their fondest hopes were were defeated or lost, and are only now we're still living with the consequences. Do you think, Pankaj? I mean, I'm just, you know, no, found myself I mean, if you, if you know, Ma Mao and uh, you know the Iranian Revolution. Absolutely. And I mean, look at the, look at the calamities in places like China. Um, even Ch I mean, China is a is a very garish example of that. Uh, the kind of human costs that have been paid to make China the strong power it is today. The innumerable victims of the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, the millions of people who died in famine, all for what? To make China this strong nation state. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost, the human cost of so many other countries have been well concealed, well suppressed, uh, whether it's Turkey or Taiwan or South Korea, or India for that matter. Mm -hmm. The immense effort and energy, the resources we've invested in the last 64, 65 years into holding on to this territory that we know as, as India. Mm -hmm. Holding on to these minorities um, and, and not just holding on, actually suppressing them in, 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 in many instances. Uh, going to wars, uh, building up a huge military. Look at Pakistan, same story there. Um, when we, uh, in our own histories, I mean, you know, these are very old societies. The nation states of India and Pakistan are very young but the societies are much, much older. Mm -hmm. And over you know, centuries and centuries, we had developed resources, mm -hmm. uh, forms and means of coexistence. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, these societies would have perished a long time ago. Um, those uh, forms of knowledge have been largely lost to us. And this is what, this is what Tagore's lament at a very early stage in this process, that look, don't give up, don't turn your back mm -hmm. on these histories, on these traditions. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you're looking at, what you're seeking to adopt, this, this particular nationalism which is so glamorous and which is so attractive because it comes to you from the West, look at what it is doing to European powers themselves. Look at the wars they've been fighting. Look at the violence and bloodshed there. And of course, the 20th century, I mean, he, he died too early to see some of the more um, ghastly uh, events of the bloodiest century ever. Uh, but you know this 20th century, uh, you know, fully confirmed his his message in the sort of ethnic cleansings, the the, the two world wars, um, and not to mention you know the uh, unaccounted for crimes of post-colonial nation states all across Asia, whether it's Indonesia or I mean any number of places. Uh, just about every country, whether it's Thailand, Burma, has been uh, struggling basically to impose this idea of the nation state upon these very old multi-ethnic societies. Uh, everywhere, I mean, there is an ethnic or more than one uh, insurgency or something or other going on. How do you think that'll, I mean, it's impossible to, to say, isn't it? But when you look at British India, for, for example, and you look at that map in the kind of Murray's Guide for 1929 or something, and there's a patchwork of 675 kind of small states, large states, princedoms, a couple of them as big as big European countries. Um, and you look at the, what you call the great disaster of partition in, in your book, and the still continuing struggles in different parts of the country. Um, any signs as to what, how the next phase of that will pan out? I mean, 60 years is only a short time, isn't it, from those catastrophes? Any thoughts on that legacy? Or the, uh, uh, does, does the past still contain clues to the future? <laughs> uh, I probably should refrain from um, saying... <laughs> <laughs> probably should just confine myself to okay. uh, providing a you know, somewhat accurate accounting of the past. Okay. The, fu the future yeah. is always risky because yeah. you're always made to look foolish mm -hmm. uh, by what happens next. Mm -hmm. So but there are multiple possibilities. There, there are multiple poss possibilities, yeah. you know, yeah. and I think so much is still in play. Um, the, the fact that we have these histories, we have, uh, you know, these archives, these memories, these traditions, and the fact that, you know, we can draw upon them anytime we want to, mm. um, yeah. that we haven't actually, you know, lost sight of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're always there. Well, um, in a moment, I'm going to throw it open to the audience because so many terrific and important ideas have, are, um, have come, 
come out of this already. And uh, just a, a brief sort of uh, sum up on your three extraordinary characters. Um, fascinating, every one of them worth a, almost a feature film of their own, aren't they? I mean, one thinks of Afghani's amazing, that amazing face and those extraordinary journeys. What an extraordinary character he is. Uh, and how little we know of these people. Do you know, it was the 150th anniversary of Tagore's birthday last year, and I approached the BBC to do a commemorative documentary about this fascinating figure, not about his poetry, but about his uh, politics and his journeys. And I was told that he, he didn't, um, didn't figure enough to put on British television. Can you believe it? That's another so black mark against the BBC. It's a, it's, a, it's a black mark, isn't it? You know, these are... Uh, and, and it only underlines, it seems to me, what you're trying to say in the book, which is a, a, a book which is also about historiography, isn't it? It's about how we have been taught to see our history. And by focusing on these three extraordinary figures, you situate yourself in another position to see these great events of history, don't you, Pankaj? Well, I think it's... it's I suppose it is. Um, history is a way of... Um, Orient, orienting ourselves to the world we live in and, sh you know, defining, uh, finding for ourselves our place in the world, our place, uh, our relationship <coughs> with uh, events in the past, with uh, the uh, political configurations in the present. And I think, uh, I've thought this for some time now, that so much of the history we are taught uh, in our respective nation states, I grew up in India, weaned on a particular version of nationalist history mm. in which the Indian National Congress, the Indian Nationalist Movement was the greatest thing on earth. And the British were uh, terribly wicked and we scored a major victory over them. Then there was this uh, villain called Jinnah who stole Pakistan <laughs> away, um, really um, sort of unpleasant figure. And then, we, you know, the other history you have access to is the history the mainstream history authored in London and New York, the sort of old and the new imperial centers. Mm -hmm. And they give you this, you know, sort of glowing picture of uh, how the West made the modern world and how people should really ought to be grateful mm -hmm. to the West for being made in the image of the West. And uh, neither of those histories really account for our place in the world. I mean, you know, the history of the nation state, uh, whether it's India or Pakistan or Sri Lanka, it doesn't tell you uh, about, for instance, the links between Tagore and Liang Chichao, mm -hmm. this whole cosmopolitan world that existed 65 years ago and had existed for centuries and centuries. Mm -hmm. You know, you had Persians from uh, Persians going all the way to Banaras uh, and setting up a center of Persian literary culture there, you know, mm -hmm. all the way down south. Uh, Indians traveling all the way to Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, the, the courts of Java and Sumatra acquiring symbols of Sanskritic culture. Mm -hmm. You know, all of this history is lost to us and has been lost to us mm -hmm. in these histories of the nation state. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we need now, and I, and I feel increasingly, are global histories that in some ways speak to where we are living in a globalized world with all these many layers of identity. You know, we ni neither of us uh, belong to one particular nation state anymore. I mean, the ways in which our, that was always a fiction. You know, the ways in which our identities are infused, layered, and informed by, you know, so many different histories. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's where uh, uh, histories that kind of, in some sense, you know, transcend these, the sort of, at least the sectarianism of this, the nation state histories become so, so important. Yeah. Oh, tremendous. Um, I was uh, did an interview not long ago with Jim O'Neill, who's the, um, the 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 BRICS guy for Goldman Sachs, who, who uh, showed me on his computer their attempted um, reconstructions of what the world's GDP had been going back into the Renaissance period, and uh, estimated. And it is only an est estimate that. For instance, India had at least 20% of the GDP of the world in, in 1600, but was 3% in 1900. And I said to him, uh, you know, come on, what's the future, Jim, you know, and all that. And he said, well, of course, you know, the pattern of history, apart from these moments where the, a, a technological leap was gained by 
the, the, the Atlantic seaboard countries and, of course, that crucial thing of them being able to take the whole of the new world and its natural resources and dispossess its people and, have, and put their surplus people in there as well as take their resources. He said, you know, the crucial thing is population. And, uh, and of course, the great traditional civilizations of India and China will inevitably uh, rise again to the position they were then. And, uh, you know, we are watching it now as here in Goldman Sachs on, on, uh, on Fleet Street, you know. So, uh, uh, which only underlines that this perspective you've given us, Pankaj, is just, uh, I think, thrilling, you know, when you read the book, um, uh, to rediscover the lineaments of other ways of seeing the world in, with such a truly fascinating characters is great. So I'd like to thank you very much, and we'll throw it over to questions. Um, questions, yes, gentlemen. Gentlemen, I'll, I'll, I'll relay the question. Gentleman first on the left there, yeah. Uh, I have to confess that I haven't read the book yet. So the, the question is based purely on this conversation. Now the question is this. I think it's easy to become starry-eyed about the civilization histories of different countries like India and China and assume that we can only you know, borrow from the past some people will eulogize it as a golden past, and therefore ignore the modern world, the technology, the military, the science, and industry, all that goes with it. Now, the behavior of states is determined by the structure of international relations and how they operate. And at the time of India's independence, it was a dominance for the two superpowers, you know, with accessory power like Great Britain as a minor accessory by then. Therefore, what should a country like India do, or China for that matter, if they were not to invest in uh, industry, in science, in technology, and inevitably military power? Because after all, it was the lack of military power and technology which left, led to the decline and the collapse of the Mughal Empire, as did the Ottoman Empire, as did the Manchu dynasty. Let, let's put that. Let's put that so question. Just, so the question, therefore, is: What is the alternative that the goal, and presumably, Pankaj, you are endorsing that? What was the alternative open to countries like India and China? It's a, it's a, it's a very important question because I think uh, someone like Tagore was just beginning to witness how countries, how pe many people in Asian societies in order to match, or in order to simply survive in this, in this world, as you say, you know, international relations count for a lot in those situations, in order to survive as you know, functional societies, um, they were forced to do a lot of things that the West had done previously and adopt those models. Um, and this is, this is part of the whole tragedy of this history, this is part of the tragic arc of the history that even this book describes is that uh, you know, people were forced to constitute themselves to organize these political movements, whether in China or India. And, you know, and there were internal debates, whether it's between Gandhi or Nehru or Gandhi and Tagore about what shape or what direction. And this, these, these, these debates, by the way, happened in practically every country um, that was uh, faced with this challenge from the West. But at some point, those debates were settled often by external events by the pressure of external defense. In China's case, it was 1919 and the humiliation um, at the uh, Paris Peace Conference where a generation decided enough is enough, we need to you know, have a proper political movement and unify China through force. And that, of course, played, played itself out over the next few decades or so. But at the same time, I think one doesn't have to look at it you know, as a question of either or because there's so many other things that could have been done uh, that were possible. There are certain you know, ways in which you could have developed your economy. You know, the idea that industrialization uh, was going to make you very, very powerful at that time, which was an idea embraced by practically every post-colonial country, which you know, committed these, these countries with huge agrarian populations to a particular trajectory now. Initially, they adopted socialism. In recent years, in the last 20 years, they've started to embrace, you know, somewhat uh, some 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 forms of capitalism. 
Um, uh, but again, the trajectory remains the same, industrialization, urbanization. But when you step back, you have to recognize that large countries like India and China, or even Indonesia for that matter, cannot become carbon copies of Western European countries or the United States. The world simply doesn't have the resources uh, to provide for the urban consumer-oriented lifestyles of 2.6 billion people. You know, everything is against you. The, the, the maths is against you, the metrics, are, everything is against you. It's just not gonna happen. So what people like Tagore or Liang, any number of people at that time, were basically saying was that, look, we have to divide, we have to do certain things. Uh, you know, and, and in the end, even someone like Gandhi, who was a great critic of Western modernity, was also a nationalist. He was also, in the end, he settled for the nation state. And the, there are certain things you have to do, but there are certain things you don't have to do, and certain things you can do in a certain way. Um, so all these debates, which are impossible to summarize you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a short reply, uh, those ideas, those ideas that were thrown up at that time, they are still in play, and they, they remind us of our contemporary predicament, which is of you know, countries which have been set this impossible standard and failing, constantly failing to achieve those standards. And you know, with, as a result, <coughs> building up a lot of political disaffection, having a lot of fundamentalist movements internally, full of disaffected, angry people who feel they're being left out, who feel they're being given a raw deal. So you have this sort of, you know, this, this cycle of violence, of conflict, uh, whether it's socialism or capitalism, in, in, in some ways you could say that, you know, last 20 years of globalization by raising expectations has created more scope for conflict and, and, and have actually exposed many more societies to uh, violence and conflict by simply by promising a lot but delivering very little. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, people like uh, the, the figures I talk about were warning against that, that situation. Let's take another question. Somebody put their hand up over there, didn't they? Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, Helen. <coughs> yes, here in Europe, we see some of the unified, previously unified countries like Spain and Italy and even the UK having increasing pressures to, to unravel some of that long-standing unity mm. from internal pressures. Mm. And I wonder if you had any view of what your protagonists might have made of that. About Europe? Well, about the unraveling or the, the pressure for unraveling the unif some of the unified nation states that, that we have. What, of Europe? Yes. Well, I mean, European Union is such a new idea that uh, it's hard to you know, think of it as something that has been existing for a long, it's such a rickety thing, as increasingly as is shown. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't very clear. I was thinking of not, not the EU unraveling, right. but the individual, some of the individual countries, like Britain, mm. Spain, Yes, Spain, yes, I, know, I see what you mean. Yes, mm. yes, absolutely. Well, you know, I think the, the basic thing that, uh, you know, if you, if you want to boil it down into something, something very basic and simple, what people like uh, Liang or Tagore uh, were warning against was that this whole idea of money making as a central concern of societies, of human society, the idea of greed being enshrined as a central principle of human societies, the idea of competition, uh, that is going to lead to conflict, disorder, stability. This is fine, all this is okay, as long as you are powerful, you're strong, and you have the world, entire world at your disposal, which was the case for these small societies of Western Europe when they went, what this guy was telling you, um, from, uh, or the, the, the man who co coined um, BRICS, yeah. uh, Jim O'Neill, yeah. uh, that these people got out early, conquered the world, conquered Latin America, got access to those resources, <coughs> then went out and used the strength they had accumulated to subjugate other peoples, other societies, and have access to their resources. And their success was built upon that, that sort of that early start and early success. So we can't, a, these weaker societies cannot hope to emulate this whole process. I mean, it's practically it's impossible to do that because the world has already been <laughs> dominated and there are no spare continents to, to conquer. Um, when now, when you look at 
uh, what, what's happening in so many of these smaller countries that were once very powerful, is that they are relatively weaker, you know, and they don't have the same access to resources. They don't, that, so the whole pol political philosophy, the whole worldviews, that were built on the basis of imperial conquest. Uh, they have been, they, they proved themselves to be completely unsustainable when that basis is taken away. And, and so if you, take, if you want to take a long-term picture, this is what is happening, is that you know, countries that derive their power from certain advantages that they've accumulated uh, over a, at a certain period in history, when that power is not there, then those advantages leak away. And then you're left to fend for yourself. You're as exposed as any Asian third world society to conflict. Mm -hmm. And that's what I suspect is going to happen more and more. The Buddha was right then. <laughs> <laughs> he was. <laughs> Another question. Yes, lady there. Um, could I just make one point after the scouring? Is that, um, do you believe that the Islamic state was actually faced up the realities of globalization and that we are having to deal with things like the diversity in our own cultures and populations that the, the countries that you're talking about have always had to live with and have had to traditionally found ways of dealing with um, and is it the case that something needs to be done to ensure that we actually learn from other countries and, and increase the understanding of how we can actually live in a more unified um, and harmonious, I suppose, existence. I'm all for Does Europe learning clear, from other countries. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, you, you put your finger on it. I think um, the fact is that Europe itself had a very long tradition of you know, accommodating various minorities. Uh, the Habsburg Empire uh, is, a, is a classic example of that. And when it started to shatter, Joseph Roth, uh, who wrote beautifully about the fading of that old order, a Jewish person who realized that although there was a lot of anti-Semitism <coughs> of an old sort in the Habsburg Empire, what was going to come next was going to be much worse, and so right he was in the early 20th century. So even within Europe, the whole tradition of coexistence, of dealing with difference, cultural difference, <coughs> religious difference, even here that has been lost you know, a great deal. And I think that's where the experience of, you know, for instance, the Ottoman Empire or the Qing Empire, which had, it's, it's, it's important not to romanticize their experience, but they also had, they had devised certain means of managing, of accommodating that kind of religious ethnic diversity. Uh, so people persecuted in Europe could flee to uh, the Ottoman Empire and find refuge there for centuries and centuries. Um, I think we've kind of, because we've been so focused on, you know, this history of a very small part of the world and absorbing all its lessons, whatever lessons, you know, we can, we can get from it, we've forgotten that there are many, many other histories out there. Uh, and that, you know, this whole process of creating political institutions, of managing <coughs> diversity of dealing with economic distress. You know, other societies have a lot of experience of that as well. Um, so I think, you know, to, to basically reiterate what you implied in your question, we, we definitely need, we need to learn from you know, other societies at this point. Chekhov didn't really go into you know, very specific, de I mean, he was not a policy maker, neither was he a think tank wonk. Um, he wasn't prescribing you know, what we should do in a, in a particular situation. He was offering a, a fairly broad critique of nationalism and, the main, the, and, and what he saw as a sort of, basically the idea of organizing societies uh, because so that those societies become internationally competitive and have access to 
the best resources and all that. He was, he was very much against this idea that societies should be organized in that way around the idea of greed and exploitation and expansion. Um, if, he, you know, if, if one were to think of an alternative to that, um, you know, any number of examples come to mind, including very recently, um, if one were to start citing an alternative, the uh, autonomy uh, principle that was signed, an agreement that was signed very recently in the Philippines between the uh, central authority and the um, secessionists there, the Muslim secessionists there, which is a kind of ideal document for how so many states in Asia could conduct their uh, domestic uh, relations with various ethnic religious minorities is that, you know, here is a, uh, or even Indonesia for that matter, I mean, there was a lot of violence, a lot of conflict and horrific violence, but in the end, you know, East Timor uh, was given independence, um, Aceh province, again, you know, outstanding problems, but there are ways in which you can conceive of a more federal structure, greater autonomy, you know, for uh, um, minority dominated regions. And there's no, I mean, there's enough compelling reason to be extremely suspicious of this old model of the centralized nation state. I mean, yeah. the biggest is the self-interest, isn't it? Is, uh, it? Doesn't the nation state almost inevitably involve us in the destruction of the planet, the environment, and everything else? I mean, we're, we're totally on that trajectory, aren't Absolutely. we, in a competitive, yeah. growth-directed uh, global economy? Exactly. There's no way out on that, is yeah. there? Every, everything yeah. shows that. Absolutely. So we do have to think, as Tagore and the others thought, Decentralization, you know, giving giving people more scope to devise their own economic yeah. political solutions. Gentlemen, right at the back, with your hand up, do you want to? <coughs> Sorry, could you just elaborate on on why this link between the nation state? and going to hell in the handcart, if you like. Um, I mean, we have to organize our societies in some way, um, globally, or whatever. What, what is, why is the nation state wrong in that sense? Well, the way uh, the uh, figures in the book saw it, and they saw it very clearly because they could, they could see how small number of people starting out in Western Europe, had managed to conquer the world, had managed to become extremely strong by embracing the idea of the organized society. And I mean, in some sense, the French Revolution is the beginning of that. And Napoleon and, and, and then the French being so successful in dominating other societies in Europe, then universalized this model of the nation state. So everyone else in Europe starts to imitate the French and thinking their success lies in developing this model of the nation state. And they in turn become an example to a lot of people in Asia who think, well, this is the way to strength, to national strength and to dignity and to power. But the problem is, which it, it's impossible again to explain this in, five, in, in, in two minutes or five minutes or even 10 minutes, but the problem with the whole idea, which a lot of people pointed out, was that the whole history of the nation state is built upon endless violence and endless expansion. That it involved you know, a lot of imperial conquest and violence, and that uh, the, the, this model of success was built upon a lot of blood. So this is, in the end, quite unsustainable for many other societies which didn't quite have the access to resources in Latin America, in North America, in various parts of Asia. And we cannot adopt this particular model because it's completely unsuited for us. It's all right for these small predatory societies, very predatory at one point in their, in their historical evolution, to go out and do these things and build up their strength. But it doesn't work for us. And furthermore, 
it is extremely tainted, this particular model, by the violence that has been committed in order to make this so successful. Let me just ask John, have we got time for another question or two? Or? Yeah? Terrific. Um, gentleman in the middle has had his hand up for a while, haven't you there? Yeah. <coughs> Um, you mentioned decentralization and federalism as potential solutions to these um, issues of multi-nation states as they really are in the East. But would you not say that they're really traditionally Western solutions to Western problems? No, I think that that's, it's, a, it's a good point um, because in the end what we're doing is we're putting a Band-Aid on, uh, on, the, on the problem, um, on the wound, which is a big one, a gaping one. Um, because what really will get away, get us away from this whole idea and the violence it involves is a much, much, much larger shift intellectually, politically, a much larger shift than we are able to contemplate at this point. You know, to go back to the previous question, uh, you know, why is the nation state become, you know, this, this the completely demonized entity in the course of the last hour or so? Here, <laughs> it's, it's because, you know, here we are witnessing the beginning of yet another scramble for Africa, yet another scramble for Latin America. I mean, don't we all feel a sense of deja vu when we, when we look at the headlines in the newspaper? All this has happened in the past, and it involved a lot of violence and a lot of exploitation. Maybe the violence and the exploitation won't happen the same way, but it's still you know, requires, it still requires a lot of people to be exploited, a lot of people to be pushed down, a lot of people to be suppressed before some people can become prosperous and successful. And so in order to completely move away from that, we'll have to, you know, we'll have to have a larger shift. And that's beyond, I mean, that's, you know, entering a realm of uh, uh, speculation at this point. But, you know, these were some of the things people like Tagore and Liang we're talking about, you know, what do we need? Here we are, an agrarian society. What are our needs? How does one define economic growth? And these are questions now being taken up, of course, um, as economic growth, uh, you know, is, is, is sort of declining in many countries. We, people are beginning to talk of zero economic growth, new indexes of happiness. How do we measure contentment, human contentment? Maybe it's not to be found in GDP growth. You know, a lot of our orthodoxies are being dismantled at this point. But these people were saying this very early on, were questioning this whole particular model. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to shift from that, then one has to make that larger shift mm -hmm. and not just, you know, talk about, you're right, not just talk about federalism and autonomy. There's a book called How Much is Enough, which is on you know, everybody's Christmas recommendations in the Sunday newspapers, isn't there? These are interesting. Gentlemen there. Yeah. Parallel to the travel of these fascinating characters, and given the three industrial empires were based on land conquest, and then the first one, the Western ones, are because of the Navy, the superiority of the Navy. In your book, that the Chinese had built the Navy, which was colossal and fearsome, and then was destroyed, the Navy. How do you extrapolate <coughs> the fact that the Chinese are trying to steal the land of China and bring it to North India also? Today? You mean, uh, sorry, I didn't get the last bit. In your book, you describe how once China was the greatest Navy. Well, compared to that, the Western navies are very small, and the West has since expanded because of the navy. The supremacy, global supremacy, is because of navy. Mm -hmm. And now China is trying to expand its navy, and of course, the American supremacy is very good at basically expanding all. Yes, well, the Chinese were playing. I mean, they were not interested in um, you know expansion at that point where they had this navy and. Chinese sailors could travel very far down deep into the Persian Gulf. But they were not interested in an empire. They were not interested in overseas conquest at that time. And they, most of their trade was conducted over land. So they did not invest in a massive navy. 
and at some point, you know, decided to basically completely shut off um, any kind of naval exploration. Although, mind you, a lot of uh, uh, Chinese still went out and traded and overseas Chinese communities expanded all across Southeast Asia. So, you know, all of that went on. But the official line was that we don't do these things. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Europeans arrived, the Portuguese, and put these new technologies of Europe to new uses altogether. I mean, the Chinese had also made massive advances uh, in, uh, you know, all kinds of scientific advances that had been made in China. But it was the Europeans who put them to a new use altogether, using them, for instance, uh, you know, superior armaments, mm -hmm. and uh, using that, using that, uh, using them in actual wars mm -hmm. um, against uh, many, many of the Asian peoples they encountered. So they were very quickly successful and were able to, you know, beat back any kind of uh, domestic challenge to them in these places. It's interesting, isn't it? The, um, do you remember there was a um an advert for McDonnell Douglas, wasn't there? A full-page advert in one of the times or whenever it was back in the 70s, which said that in 1422, 1433, whenever it was, the Chinese uh, stopped their voyages and, and dismantled their fleets. This would be like stopping at Apollo 8 or something like that, you know, and it was a, in, a, a peon to Western inventiveness and to the Chinese... Um, um, uh, closing down their, their, their view of the world, if you like. But I think most writers on this, and Theodore de Barry wrote an absolutely brilliant series of essays on this, was that the Chinese bureaucrats and thinkers, having spent, I think there were five or seven major voyages, weren't they? And the biggest of them were 27,000 uh, men on board and huge ships. And they went down as far as uh, East Africa. Um, that they simply, they had no intention of conquering other nations. Not, they, they, they were interested in showing the flag and, and obviously extending their rule over people of Chinese, peoples of Chinese origin on the fringes of China. But otherwise, they really were, um, uh, you know, showing the flag and bringing Exotica back to um, uh, Beijing. But um, they simply stopped those voyages and broke up those huge ships and even destroyed the logbooks because... Um, uh, they deemed the true goal of their government was to cultivate the uh, um, life of the nation within the borders of Zhongwu. You know that that was it. So it wasn't it wasn't their business to go sailing off and doing those things. So they simply put a stop to it all. So it is different from modern navies and military expansiveness, isn't it? Pardon. Well, not the same. Well, I mean, to the, to the degree that they're going off to East Africa and impressing people, and, uh, but uh, they weren't uh, um, taking giraffes back to Beijing, but it's not quite the same as um, buying up the natural resources of entire countries, is it? One more, time for one more? one more? One more. Lady there. I'll relay your question. Oh, we've got the microphone there. Yep. Your main resources for your sources for your research, and in what languages? Mostly English, um, and you know, all over. I mean, I kind of read completely randomly because very few models for a um, book like this, and I had a kind of freedom which was both liberating, but also oppressive in the sense that there were few models, but at the same time, I could you know, travel across disciplines which, for instance, a trained academic would find it hard to do because you have to, you know, satisfy different protocols, mm -hmm. um, linguistic, do a lot of work in a one area for a long time before you venture out into another. Mm -hmm. As an amateur, I could happily disregard those <laughs> protocols mm -hmm. and just do my own thing mm -hmm. and read randomly. You know, I, I think of myself as a maker of narrative. Um, and that helped me write this book. I did not for a moment think of myself as a historian. I think it would be presumptuous to do that. Um, I think of, I thought of myself as putting together these stories, you know, drawing from whatever source I could find, wherever. And, and there's, a, there's a very helpful bibliographical essay at the back, actually, for all of us who are, you know, excited by these tales and uh, you want to look elsewhere. I, mean, I knew some of Nikki Keddy's 
books on, on Persian culture, but I hadn't realized she'd written a political biography of, uh, of Afghani himself. Oh, I heard from know. her. She was, she was very pleased. Yeah, that, you know, uh, so these, they, 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 like, like all really fascinating books, it just sparks you off wanting to know more. And that's, that's great, isn't it? <coughs> Shall we? Uh, well, I should call a halt. But, uh, Thank you, Michael and um, I th <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that raised many more questions than can be answered, but um, it's wonderful to have a book that shifts the focus both geographically, intellectually, and culturally in looking at... Um, history of imperialism. And I would echo the, um, your remarks about the bibliographical essay. Um, I see in that you have John Gray's After Tamerlane, which is, uh, I shouldn't plug another author's books today, but that is another great work where the cultural focus is shifted. And I think it's quite an exciting period of history to, to live in, to be starting to look at it not from the very selfish Western perspective. So I believe there are copies of the book for sale outside, and if I could just bring this part of the proceedings to a close and ask you once more to thank Michael and Pankaj for their discussion tonight. Thank you.